So let me introduce our speaker. So there's a great quote from Abraham Lincoln. Teach the children so it will not be necessary to teach the adults. Teach the children so it will not be necessary to teach the adults. As of 2017, there's nearly 6 million people in the state of Colorado, and over 25% of those who live here are under the age of 18. Each of these young minds are being molded daily, and all of us hold a responsibility to help positively impact the next generation. Teachers and educators are one of the biggest influencers of this change, and they have the weighty and powerful role of helping to educate the next generation of leaders, innovators, and doers. These public servants inspire, foster curiosity, and share their wisdom with young people. They challenge our opinions and help us create goals while pushing students to reach a higher standard. And each of us knows of someone like that who may have impacted our kids or our own lives as well. Teachers break down barriers to create new tools and methods to help students better understand, which is one of the most powerful gifts to be given. I truly believe, however, that each of us in this room, regardless of our profession or background, must partner in this calling to influence the next generation in some positive way. Whether that be through parenting, mentoring, educating, or teaching, we all have a moral duty to come alongside children to do our part in giving them the tools needed for success to continue to better our state, country, and world. Julie Clark, founder of Baby Einstein, dedicated her life to doing just that. Julie began as a Colorado high school teacher. It was during this journey that she realized that there was not enough products or materials to educate her own young ones, seeing a need and then trying to fill it. She had dreams of teaching them about her own passions, such as literature, art, and music. Recognizing the gap in the market, for us entrepreneurs in the room, that's what we look for, right? Um, she set out to fill it, and Baby Einstein was born. Julie started from scratch, filming and editing videos in her basement. After investing 15000 in her own vision and work, she connected with a retailer who was willing to partner with her vision. They immediately sold out of every video. $25 million, and five years later, Julie sold the highly successful Baby Einstein company to Disney. Who in the room has seen Baby Einstein? As a parent, I can tell you, I've spent many hours on the couch with my kids, back when they used to sleep on my chest, which I still miss to that day, and now they're 15, 18, and 26, so that would not be a good thing if they tried to do that right now. Um, but we spent many hours in front of baby Einstein. As Julie's children grew, she began to notice another missing piece in education, specifically pertaining to safety and the internet. Julie's passion and vision for our next generation led her to create the safe side, which educates children on safety on the internet. I want to make sure I get all this right. So, well, okay, I'm going to be quick though. I'm going to, I'm going to, I know, but you're, you're so awesome. I want to make sure we get to touch some of this. The safe side grew rapidly and the videos are now shown across the nation. 100% of the proceeds from the safety videos go to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I just think it's just awesome. In 2008, Julie was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. Julie underwent an intense cycle of chemo treatments to combat the aggressive cancer. Against all odds, she beat the disease, not once, but twice. Just pretty awesome. Let's give her a round of applause for that. <laughs> After her experience, she authored the children's book, You Are the Best Medicine, which is a resource that educates children about cancer and how to walk alongside parents who are diagnosed. The proceeds of the book go directly to research for a cure. I just learned, though, that Julie not only authored that book, but 50 other children's books, probably in her spare time, right? I just love that. Uh, Julie continued to pour into the next generation, including creating an app called WeSchool, which helps parents track and itemize their children's necessities. Julie has never stopped inventing and striving to create better, more interactive products when she saw they were missing. Her innovative spirit has helped equip millions of parents around the world with resources centered around educating our children. 
Julie's philanthropy and acts of service have impacted both young and old as she has helped facilitate efforts in keeping our children safe, healthy, and more empowered. I am thrilled to welcome Julie Clark to speak with us this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And seriously, that was my whole story. I really don't have anything else to say. So enjoy your drinks. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so thank you. And it is so, it's like a huge honor to be here. I really appreciate your time in wanting to hear what I have to say, so thank you. Um, I always try to start out with the word remarkable. I love the word remarkable. And the reason I love the word remarkable is because it makes us think about what we want people to say about us, right? I mean, I think that what happened to me was that, um, hang on, my little, there we go, sorry. I, I think that what happened to me was I didn't know that people were going to say things about me at some point until, as you, you heard, um, I was diagnosed with cancer. And then you, you know, when you're at a younger age thrown into the reality of, you know, life is a terminal illness, but you really start thinking about it, um, it's, it's different. And you do start thinking about how you want to be remembered, right? Like if something... God knows, I mean, I'm not here to talk about sad things, but if something were to happen to you tomorrow, how would people talk about you? What would they say about you? And so I like the word remarkable because it reminds us that what have we done that makes us worthy of attention or extraordinary or exceptional or astounding, marvelous, wonderful, sensational? And um, I think that's fun to think about. So remarkable. Um, baby Einstein is probably the first thing that people think of when they think, wow, this was a person who did something remarkable. But I like to think of myself as a teacher first. So I started out teaching high school um, and middle school, and I taught English and art, and that was my passion. And so um, I decided to leave that, even though I loved it so much, because I was pregnant and I was having my first child, and I thought, I want to be a stay-at-home mom. My own mom worked, and it was just so important to me to be that mom that was going to be there for my kiddos when they came home from school. Um, my daughter was born, and this tiny little baby struck me immediately as this bundle of opportunity, as every baby is. Every baby that's born is a bundle of opportunity, right? And what we put into that sponge, right? Think of your baby as a little sponge. Everything that we put in matters. We think of the food we feed them. We know that matters. But what's going on up here matters so much. And I knew that. I loved child development. I loved teaching. So I had this little bundle of opportunity. And I thought, what can I give her that doesn't exist right now? I looked around, and there was no way to expose her to some of the things that I loved and believed in. So for me, those were things like classical music, poetry, art, nature, science. And all that was on television, this was 1994, by the way, was Barney and Teletubbies. And I was not going to watch that in my house. My baby was not going to watch that in my house. So um, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Really, like, this is all there is. And, and there have to be other parents like me who are going, wow, this is bad. So um, I came up with this idea. What about taking something like classical music, which is beautiful and can't be bad for babies and doesn't bother me. I can have it on in the background when my husband and I are eating dinner and it's not going to make me blow my brains out like the Barney song does. Um, and then I took that music that I love so much, and I combined it with images that my baby likes to look at or that I want my baby to look at, images from the real world. So I knew from stuff I'd read that babies um, are very focused on independent objects. It's very confusing for a new baby to see animation, to see fast-moving things. I knew that the images that my baby could see best would be on a black or a white background, and that they would be really simple things, like the cat. <laughs> so take the cat, put the cat on the table, take a video of the cat, seriously. Um, the toys that she liked playing with. Um, things like a lava lamp, like 
on a white background, a black lava lamp moving slowly. Like that was fascinating for my baby to look at. And I could make a video, and I did make my first video in my basement, shot on borrowed video equipment, and edited on Adobe Premiere way back when. Like it would take, for anybody who makes video now, and I know a lot of people are in digital marketing and you know a lot about video, it literally would take three hours to render a 10 second clip. Like, and, and it was crazy. So anyway, so baby Einstein was born. I came up with the idea for the name in my kitchen. I love the idea of what do I want my baby to be? Of course, I want her to be really smart or I want her to be really good at music. I want her to be really good at writing. So I had this idea for this baby Einstein, baby Mozart, baby Shakespeare, baby Van Gogh, baby Bach, baby Beethoven, right? So these were all the videos that ultimately came out of this original idea of exposing my baby to something that was good, something that I loved. And I realized pretty early on that my idea was worth nothing unless I did something with it. So this is actually something that I have a sign in my office I see every day. You are what you do, not what you say you will do. Because so many people say to me, oh, I had so many good ideas and then somebody took my idea. I was like, oh really? Well, did you ever do anything with your idea before somebody else took it? Ah, uh, no, well, there you go. So you are what you do, not what you say you will do. Do it, right? Believe in yourself. Be remarkable, have a remarkable idea, and do something with it. So this is just something that was innate in me. Um, I wouldn't say that I thought of myself as entrepreneurial in nature, but um, ultimately I think I really became very entrepreneurial, as, as you heard, with a number of the things that I've been able to, to do in the last several years. Um, I believe very much that we make our own luck. So. Several years ago, I was talking to a family member, and um, something had happened to me. I'll share it with you later. But when it happened, she said, oh, you're so lucky. And I was like, well, yeah, but you also do make your own luck, right? So nobody came to my door and said, oh, I heard you're making a video for babies, right? How did I get my idea out there? Well, the way that I got my idea out there initially is I really did make my own luck. At the time that I was um, first launching Baby Einstein, I lived in um, Georgia. I lived in Atlanta. And so um, I decided that since I had this video that I'd made and nobody had seen it yet because I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know how to sell it, um, but I had the video and I'd actually created a, a box for it and this was back in the days of VHS. Um, so, so back in the days of VHS and I had the beautiful design on the cover of the box and it was a very unique idea and a cool name and a good concept, but how was I going to get people to know about it? So I was like, well, I'm just going to call CNN because I live in Atlanta and CNN's right down the road and I'm sure they want to talk to me. So I called CNN and I got the parenting person on the phone and I said, hi, I'm Julie Clark. I'm the president of the Baby Einstein Company, which was like a bunch of a big lie because like there was really no baby Einstein company and I wasn't really the president of anything except like diaper changing. So um, I call, I get the parenting editor and I'm like, hey, I'm the president of the baby Einstein company and I have this great video and I know it's perfect for your, for any story you want to do on parenting and blah, blah, blah. I just like blah, 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 blah. But I made my own luck because here's what she said. Oh my God, that's really crazy that you would call me. I'm doing a story right now on the opposite, I'm doing a story on orphans in Romania and how the lack of stimulation affects them long term. And it would be so amazing to show your video and what you're doing that's the opposite of this. Can we come over tomorrow and do a story? And I'm like, oh, let me check my calendar. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, you can. So, so she came over and this is the result. And this is a little bit edited down, but hopefully the audio will work here. Julie Clark is putting into action baby plates, what most parents are just beginning to hear about. Exercises that enhance early childhood.
child development. The first three years of life is incredibly important. We take away. We know now that babies are really desperate to need stimulation and love it. The daily family routine involves a series of educational games. From F, right? that may actually spur critical connections in the brain of her two-year-old daughter, Aspen. Three, two, one, faster! As well as her baby on the way. Julie feels so strongly about the potential of early brain stimulation, she has produced and is now marketing a videotape for parents and their infants called Baby Einstein. Her motivation stems from a growing body of research that shows connections in the brain begin forming at a fast and furious rate even while the baby is still in the womb and are crucial to the development of language, sight, and emotion. There's also evidence that playing or listening to music at an early age can lead to a better understanding of math later on. But as Julie Clark has discovered, parents have a myriad of early learning tools right at their fingertips. There are probably thousands and thousands of baby Einstein's out there just waiting to be stimulated um, in the right way. So as parents, I think any caring parent can have a great child. Pat Etheridge, CNN, Atlanta. So that was really cool. And that was literally making my own luck. They didn't come to my door. What happened as a result of that that was so cool, of course, was the recognition. But I got a call from a guy in Japan who said, um, hey, I take American products to the Japanese market. I think Baby Einstein would really do great in Japan. Would you be interested in licensing it for the Japanese market? I'm like, sure. I hadn't even sold like a single copy in the US. So, um, so it was pretty amazing. But I did realize that the harder I work, the luckier I get, right? And we all know that. Um, so essentially, Baby Einstein, it was, it was absolutely crazy because it was so much fun. So I, I created that first video in my basement, edited it myself, as I suggested, went to a trade show, and it was tenacity that actually got my video in the door. So I knew I wanted my video to be um, at a store that I shopped at. I was my own customer. I was a mom with a baby and I was making something for other moms with babies. And so I knew I wanted my product to particularly be featured at the right start, which was a store that at the time was um, a catalog only store and since then has a number of stores around the country. But in any case, I went to a trade show tracked down some people from the right start after two days of just literally walking around 20,000 people looking at name tags and finally finding someone with a right start name tag, charged up to them, said, this is the most amazing thing you have to carry in your store. I, like I scared them, I think. I tried to get them to take this video and they were like, okay, just leave us alone. So they took it back and they brought it back to California and a month went by and I heard nothing. So after that month, I called up um, got headquarters, and this is just sort of another little tenacity, hard work sort of thing that we all do as entrepreneurs. Um, the receptionist answered the phone and I said, hi, this is Julie Clark, the president of the Baby Einstein Company. Um, I'd like to speak with Wendy. All I knew was that this woman I'd given my video to was named Wendy. I didn't know her last name, I didn't know what she did, I knew nothing else. And the receptionist says, I'm really sorry, Wendy left the company. And I go, Oh, that's right. We had lunch. We met at Toy Fair, and we had lunch, which was a total lie. And she told me how much she thought this product, my product would be great, and she gave me the name of the woman who would be covering for her, but I can't remember her name. Oh, that was Kathy, Kathy Angel. Okay, can I speak with Kathy? So I get Kathy on the phone, same story. Oh, Wendy and I met at Toy Fair. She loved my video. She thought it would be great for your store. She told me to call you, like, lie, 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 lie. Anyway, it worked. So my other lesson is work hard and sometimes tell little lies. <laughs> it worked. It worked for me. So over a period of five years that I owned Baby Einstein, starting in 1997, we did pretty much some really amazing sales, right? 
Um, we started that first year, I had invested $15,000 to make that first video. And that was essentially the cost of really just getting the music produced, because I did everything else. Um, so $15,000, and in that first year, we did $100,000 in sales. That was with one little video that was only being sold in two stores. It was being, it was being sold at the right start, the chain, the right start, and it was being sold at Gymboree. And um, so we did $100,000 in sales, which was four times my salary when I was a teacher. And the next year, we did a million in sales. And the next year, we did five million in sales. And then we did, what, 12, 12 million in sales. And then we did 23 million in sales in the fifth year with five employees in my basement. It was crazy, right? <laughs> totally crazy. But the best thing about it is that I was doing something that I loved. Scooch that. <laughs> I was doing something that I loved. I was like making stuff for my babies. I now had two. And um, I was making stuff that people loved. I was hearing from parents, thank you, thank you, thank you, you know, for giving me an alternative and giving me an option. So in that five year period, something else really cool happened. We were selling these videos and we were doing very well. And more and more retailers were coming on board and saying, we'd, we'd really like to sell your product in our stores. And Disney called me, and this was in the third year, and they said, hey, we're really interested. We love what you're doing with videos. We're really interested in you writing some Baby Einstein books. Would you be interested? And I was like, yes, I'm an English teacher. I would love that. So over the course of the next two years, I wrote over 40 books. I think I'm at 43 books, baby books. Um, children's books, so we're not talking about like Anna Karenina here, this is like, like board books, but still, still. Um, so I wrote these books, they were published and distributed in over 40 countries, um, and things were going great. Everything was just kicking butt. Again, working with my husband, working with, you know, people that I loved, tiny group, I'm with home with my kids, so I know what I'm doing because I'm making stuff for them, and so babies are babies. Other, you know, a baby here, a baby in Israel, a baby in Africa, a baby in Afghanistan, they're all babies. I mean, they're all born, these little bundles of opportunity. So um, it was working. It was wonderful. And as I grew, some other really crazy, amazing things happened. So I'm going to play you a little clip from a Jay Leno um, from a Jay Leno broadcast. And this was one of the kinds of things that was happening. This is just an example, but pretty incredible. Isn't that amazing? I was like, oh my God, that was so cool. And then there were other opportunities and these all came about. I didn't even have a PR agency. These were all coming about because I was making something remarkable. I was making something that people remarked about. They talked about it. They told their friends about it. So when Oprah was gonna do a show on mom entrepreneurs, one of her producers had twins, and those twins loved Baby Einstein, and so I got the call. So some really great, amazing stuff was happening. 
So in the course of all of this great stuff that was happening, my babies were growing up. And if you have children, you've probably heard this phrase, the days drag on, but the years fly past. That little, these two little girls are now, one is in grad school, um, she's finishing her grad school degree at SMU, and the other is a straight A student at DU, she's a senior. Um, majoring in game design and Japanese. So they're both, you know, I mean, they're grown up. They're gone. They're not gone, but you know what I mean. Um, so, so we realized that we had this incredible opportunity to really, my husband and I, really focus on what we loved the most, which was and is still family. We were so excited at the opportunity now that our girls were four and six, to really be able to focus on them and do some cool stuff. So we said, do we want, five years into the company, which had grown and grown and grown, as I said, to continue on this growth trajectory that we were on, which would have meant hiring a lot of people and really stepping up our game. It wasn't going to be like me in the basement making videos anymore. We were really going to have to get on board because we were seeing that companies like Disney or Viacom or Nickelodeon, they were going, huh, we could do those videos. We could make something like that. So we were suddenly faced with this potential competition that was going to be big, like big competition. And we aren't those people. We're not big company people. We're entrepreneurs, educators. So we made a call to Disney. And we already had a great relationship with them because we'd been doing the books with them. So we had a publishing relationship with them. And we said, hey, we're interested in selling the company. Are you guys interested in buying it? And they said yes, which was crazy and amazing. We did the sale ourselves. We didn't have a venture capitalist involved. We, you know, now when you look at multiples of companies and what stuff's worth, it's a different world, right? This was 2001. Now there's another really important thing about 2001. Do you guys remember? Trade centers, right? So 9-11. About a month before we were going to close the deal with Disney, it was like early August, um, we were really close. Everything was moving along. September hits, and the towers fall. And everybody just comes to a standstill, right? All the big companies are saying, we're not doing any deals. Disney came out. Eisner said, we're not buying anything. You know, we're just taking it easy. We're going to wait and see what happens. And we were like, oh, my God, they're not going to buy us. But they did. And one of the reasons that they did, and this is something I was talking to someone about earlier, and if anyone in here is building a business to sell, something I can tell you that we did that was so important um, is that we just had our books in order. You have to have, you know, when people come in like a Disney or somebody big, they're going to do due diligence up the wazoo. And you have to show that you have been keeping track of every single thing along the way. So we had plug for a Denver company, EKS and H, would come in and do our books at the end of every month, and we just had amazing records. We were so clean. We had all our trademarks in order, all our legal stuff was done, and that is so key and so important. So just a little word to the wise. Um, so I think that the greatest thing, of course, you know, I sold the company and I made a bunch of money and that was incredible. And we've traveled around the world with our children. We've been to every continent, including Antarctica. Um, so, so we've been very, very fortunate. But I never could feel like I was done. I always felt like, okay, like I did something really cool and I made a positive difference and I've been able to educate my kids at home and do some really great things with them. Um, but there was something that was now really starting to bug me in my head, which was my kids are a little bit older. Like now they were like six and eight, nine. And they were a little more independent than when they were, you know, hanging onto my hand when they were two years old. Now they were playing at friends' houses or they were going outside or they were going to, you know, a neighbor's house. And I started thinking about child safety and I started thinking about how important it was for my kids to understand how to stay safe with people they don't know and with people they kind of know. And I started doing a lot of research on education and safety education. What I found was 
hideous. It was, you know, a talking head that no kid was going to watch. No kid was going to watch like a police officer telling you what to do. I realized that if I wanted to teach child safety to my kid and other kids, it had to be fun. It had to be something they wanted to watch. And, you know, you might say, well, who wants to watch, you know, a video on Van Gogh? Well, babies did. And I thought, well, if I could get high schoolers to like Shakespeare and babies to like Mozart, I bet I can get little kids to like the idea of child safety in a fun way. So I sat down and I put together a script. First time I'd ever really written a true script. And then I had um, the good fortune of meeting John Walsh who those of you who are like my age and older know from America's Most Wanted. Um, John, if you aren't aware of who he is, 35 years ago now, his son Adam was murdered and he became the first child on the box, on the, the milk cartons. And John and his wife became the first families to, family to really speak out about child abduction and ultimately started the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And so, I got this idea in my head that I was going to make this video and I would do it hopefully with John's support. And so we did it together. We made a video. We actually made two videos. Um, one is called, they're both under the brand, The Safe Side. And one is called Stranger Safety, although we never use the word stranger because kids don't understand the word stranger. They think a stranger looks scary. Um, so we call that stranger safety for parents. And then we have another one called internet safety where we teach kids how to stay safe um, on the internet. And um, those videos are initially raised a quarter of a million dollars for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So it was a not-for-profit for me. Um, and now they're all available on YouTube. So any child can watch them, any parent can watch them. We have a full curriculum around the concept of child safety. And we have a lot of schools and police departments and fire departments around the country who use the safe side videos to teach kids about child safety. So that's like a real feel good for me. And I feel like that's a really remarkable thing. Here's a little video from the safe side in case you're wondering like, how do I make that fun? And I'm here to keep you on the safe side. How do you make a comparison? A person you don't know is a lot like a dog. super chick. <laughs> um, and again, just like a really remarkable thing that we were able to offer, that we're still able to offer to kids and families to try to keep kids sick. It's sick. To try to keep kids safe. We don't want to keep them sick. <laughs> but that leads me into my next, that's probably what I was thinking. So if you know this Yiddish proverb, we plan, God laughs. Everything's going great, like gangbusters. I've sold Baby Einstein. I'm loving the safe side. Everything's going so great and so well. Um, and then, as, as you heard, um, cancer knocked on my door. And this was the first time I was 37. And um, I was obviously shocked. I was very healthy. I was a vegetarian. I didn't smoke, blah, blah, blah. I did all the right things. Um, but here it was. So um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I got through that as quickly as I could. I had surgery. It was stage one. I was lucky. Everything was great. I spent the next few years um, homeschooling my kids and, again, traveling around the country and around the world. And then four years later, um, in the midst of all of this, this is what I ended up looking like. So. Um, I decided that I was not going to be a cancer survivor. I was going to be a cancer assassin because that was so much stronger of a word, right? Like assassin? To me, words are everything. So um, 
I wasn't like hanging on to a life raft like a survivor. I was fighting. So I did chemo. The second time I was diagnosed, as you heard, I was um, diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. So I felt great. I had no idea. So I was feeling great, diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. It had metastasized to my liver and several lymph nodes. There was no surgery they could do on my liver. So I was basically told two things. I could either do what I ultimately did, which was chemo and a whole bunch of other stuff, um, medical stuff, or I could just say, I'm probably going to die because I have stage four breast cancer and most people die when they have stage four cancer. It's just, it's like 2% live 10 years out. But October 15th, so what is today, the 10th, 11th, so in four days, it's my 10 year anniversary of state of, thank you, of, um, being a cancer assassin. And, uh, and again, you know, like for me, this picture is great because to me, it, it reminds me of what I'm about, which is choosing hope. Like I'm really a glass half full person. I just am. And, um, I can, you know, you can pick whatever you want. Um, but to me, it always makes sense to pick the positive if you have an option. So um, here I am. So I decided to choose hope. And I decided, once again, that I was going to use my experience to make a difference um, in children's lives, because I'm all about little kids. So um, I love this quote from Rosa Parks, memories of our lives, our works and deeds will continue in others. And again, it's kind of the idea of being remarkable, right? What do people say about you when you're gone? What do they say? What did you do? Um, and we all can do something. So for me, with this cancer diagnosis, I decided to write a children's picture book. Um, the title is You Are the Best Medicine. And what occurred to me with this cancer diagnosis was that I was going to tell my children before I went into chemo that I was okay because they were little and I wasn't going to say mommy's probably going to die. So I was like, mommy has to take medicine and I'm going to be, I'm, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to be okay and blah, blah, blah. But what struck me is that kids are so, so literal. So you tell a child something, but everything is about what our kids see, right? That's why we say actions speak louder than words ultimately. So what do they see? When you have cancer and you're going through treatment and you've got little kids, your little kids see mommy doesn't have any hair and mommy can't get out of bed and mommy throws up every morning and, you know, mommy's lost a bunch of weight and mommy doesn't feel good and doesn't want to drive me to school. That's what our kids see. And so I wanted to write a book that was about how children, how our children, when we have cancer, are our very best, best medicine. And that the other medicine that we're taking is making us look sick, but we're getting better. And I wanted kids to understand that. So that was the impetus behind You Are the Best Medicine. Um, ultimately, as, as I've kind of expressed, I kind of just keep creating and doing stuff, sometimes to my detriment. And I'm like, what am I, what am, why did I start another company? Because um, none of them have been as easy as Baby Einstein. But um, what I started to think about more and more now that my own kids, no, they don't have their own kids, but hopefully in the next 10 years they will. Um, <laughs> so I started thinking about parents today and how parents today are different than parents in my generation. So this is what parents today look like, right? A lot of them are looking at their device. And I know if that's, if you say that's not you, you're a big fat liar. Um, <laughs> so, so they're looking at their device. And they're not always looking at their baby. I'm sure you guys see this. You see people walking with a stroller and they're not even like pointing out the birds to their baby. They're staring at their phone or they're on Facebook and somehow their social media is more important than looking in their baby's eyes. So I thought, I can teach parents how to do a good job. How can I teach parents how to do a good job? I guess I have to do it in an app because this is where parents get all their information. And we know that they're always searching. Parents are always online searching for like developmental milestones. What should my baby be doing when they're five months old or six months old or seven months old? When will they say mama? When will they crawl? When will they walk? I knew I could answer all that stuff in an app. But what I decided to do was do that, which I've done. Um, but what I really wanted to do was create like a day by day sort of activity guide of things that you can do with your baby every day. Do 
one thing. It takes 15 minutes. I'm not giving you like hours of work. I'm not giving you a ton of homework. This is your baby. Spend time with your baby. And if you don't know what to do, here's an idea. Oh, your baby's seven months old. They're probably just about ready to crawl. Here's something you can do to get them to crawl. So when you put we school, which is the name of my company, we being like teeny tiny, W-E-E. -E. The idea is we school is what comes before preschool and it's what you do at home. You do it or your caregiver does it, your nanny does it, you know, your grandma does it, if grandma's watching the baby. And what the impact of it is, is healthier development because we're really trying to work here on increasing the benefits of early childhood development preschool readiness, and engaged parents. So what's really sad and um, interesting is that in America, one in four children enters preschool, not ready for preschool, but one in four children coming from a lower socioeconomic background enters preschool, the age of four, a year behind at four. 25%, I mean, think about that. You can't make that up. You don't make that up. The first three years of life, the brain grows to 80% of its adult size. It's the most critical time. The most learning happens in the first three years. And our country doesn't invest in it. It blows my mind. So here's a little video of what we school is. <laughs> between this and this. The WeSchool app takes the guesswork out of parenting during those super important first three years. It features a month-by-month -month diary based on research by the doctor that invented the field of developmental milestones. A personalized milestone tracker to record your wee one's journey. Easy capture and sharing for those precious first divot moments. A pre-preschool curriculum with hundreds of fun activities. A smart musical nightlight with nine sound programs. Your wee one's first music albums. A library of interactive books by me, the creator of Baby Einstein. A collection of videos that will engage, fascinate, and delight. And expert shopping tips that make you an informed and thrifty buyer. All this and more in the palm of your hand. So, if you use the WeSchool app, will you get one of these? Maybe. But you'll certainly be one of these. You'll spend quality time with one of these. And sometimes, you'll really enjoy one of these. WeSchool. It's what comes before preschool. Enroll now. My tuition is free. Sorry about the volume. I had no control over that. Um, so that's what we school is. And today, today, October 11th, I have a thing about 11s. I think they're lucky. Um, so today, uh, we had a press release go out, and we launched we school in both the App Store and in Android 100% free. So there's no charge. So every parent can use it and get it, hopefully will. Every child can be exposed to these things. If you're on a plane with a crying baby, you can download one of our videos right onto your device and your baby can be busy on the plane. Um, and we're really, really proud of it. Now, I'll tell you the truth, which is when we first started WeSchool, we thought this was going to be a for-profit company. So we started out, the video, we, I mean, the app was only available on iOS and it cost us close to $4 million to finish this whole project in about three years. Um, there's a ton of research behind this. There's doctor stuff. There's writers and app developers and artists and all that stuff. And um, so it's been a big chunk of money. But where I've ended up on it is I just don't feel like it's right to make it available only to people who can afford it, right? I mean, like, this is like babies. Like, we want to make a difference in the world. So what we've decided to do is go free. We're 
we have amazing content. So we feel like we're very valuable as a company because of the most rich content you can get in early childhood development anymore. Um, and ultimately, our goal will be to sell this company. And who would be interested in it? In my opinion, I think um, maybe a Procter & Gamble, maybe Care.com, um, somebody who could give this to parents and maybe have a coupon for diapers so that people are buying Pampers every week. I, I don't know. I, you know, I haven't done this before, but to me, that's what makes sense. I'm also really hoping we have much of the curriculum um, developed in Spanish, but we haven't got it into the app, and that's another probably close to $150,000. So we're hoping maybe like somebody will step up and get it in Spanish because one in four, I'm sorry, one, is it? It's like almost 50%, I think, of babies born in the US this year are born into Spanish-speaking households. So we want to make sure this is available to parents who speak Spanish and read Spanish as well. You got me? Awesome. Awesome. OK, we got to talk. Yes, we got to talk. That's great. Um, so ultimately, my final, what I've tried to tell you today is to make your own luck. Um, make a difference, choose hope, and stay engaged. And um, thank you for having me today. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, three questions and we'll open up to the group as well. What was your biggest challenge in launching Baby Einstein? You know, it was funny. Baby Einstein isn't a great example at all because it was actually like so easy. I think the challenge was probably creating awareness for it. But what I learned is that um, when you have something really good, and especially if little kids really like it, because if you have a baby or you've had a baby, you know this, babies don't lie. Babies laugh or they cry. <laughs> so, so I made something that made babies laugh. So awareness at that time was all generated by word of mouth. This was before, when I started Baby Einstein, I didn't even have an email. I didn't even like have, I didn't even know the internet, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. So, um, <laughs> So, so, so um, essentially, I think creating awareness, and it's so much harder now. I find that with WeSchool and the other stuff I've done, it's so much harder now because the world is so different with, you know, everybody gets information from so many places and they want it in like less than 15 seconds. You make a Facebook ad now, if you make a video ad, they tell you it can't be longer than 15 seconds. Nobody will watch it. I'm like, really? That's a short attention span. <laughs> Love it. So if an aspiring entrepreneur came to you and said, what, was, what would be some of your greatest words of wisdom for them, what would that be? Well, if, if you're making a product um, or you offer a product, even if it's like, you know, a marketing product, like you're creating for social media or um, you've created a product like a new baby bottle, um, I would say the first thing to ask yourself is, does it exist? Chances are it doesn't, right? That's why you're making it. But if it does, why is yours going to be better? And if it doesn't, why doesn't it exist? Does it not exist because really nobody else wants it? You know, so kind of start doing your research. And for me, I always just asked friends. I asked people I knew. I went to Playgroup. I went to Gymboree. I'm like, what do you guys think of this idea? You know, and I just asked people who were in the focus group that I cared about. Um, and I think a lot of it is, is just that legwork. It's just doing the work yourself. And the other thing I would say is know what you're not good at. So for many of us, that's hard, right? Like we don't want to fail at anything. But I have learned so much from people who are better at stuff than me. So for me, I'm a creative person. I am not at all an organized person. So um, I would say if you are really not good at something, get help. Don't try to do it if you can't do it because you will waste money and you will waste time. So probably those are the two things. So you have accomplished and experienced a lot. What would you like your personal legacy to be? Oh, God. Um, that, gosh. <laughs> 
you always say it backwards. It's baby Einstein. So I would probably, um, first and foremost, want to have been a great mom. I know that sounds so cheesy, but it's so true. I have great kids. I, I love I love my family. Um, I would have wanted to have been the person that people said, she was really nice and she was really genuine. And, you know, I don't have an MBA. I didn't go to Harvard. I'm a teacher. <laughs> and I think that I'm really proud of that. Like, I'm really proud to be a teacher, both to my parents and to other kids that I've had the opportunity to influence. And now, hopefully, I'm being a good teacher to parents, teaching parents how to be good parents. So I would say that. Love it. What questions do you all have? Yes. As a marketer, I'd love to know what the what effect the Jay Leno uh, piece had on sales. So as a marketer, he wonders what the Jay Leno piece uh, had an effect on your sales, an impact. You know, honestly, we were already killing it. So it had a huge impact, but the funny thing, it, it had an impact, but the funny thing is, I didn't even know it was on. Like, I didn't watch The Tonight Show, and so somebody had to, like, call me. And then, ultimately, Ethan's dad contacted me, the kid on there, and he's like, hey, did you, want, did you see what Ethan said on The Tonight Show? And that was really cool. Um, but I would say that um, it, it had an impact, but we were already just doing so well. Probably what had the biggest impact was... Um, let me think about this for a second. I mean, we went when we went to that trade show in the second year, we went to Toy Fair, and we had a booth at this trade show for the first time, and we were really like something very new. No one had ever done this, you know, classical music for babies thing. That was just strange for people. And so we tended to get a lot of press around that time because it was a new idea. And um, so probably that boosted us more than the Leno thing, which happened like four years in. So, yeah. So she didn't tell you that Ethan quickly rose to the top salesperson in the company <laughs> and is still living off his 401k program <laughs> in Hawaii, right? I, that's what I thought you said. Yes, Nicole. So our question is, what other um, areas uh, could this be applicable to, whether it be Asperger's, PTSD, et cetera, that maybe you've explored or had an impact with? It's really interesting, because if I knew how to do technology, um, I would show you some pictures that I got this morning. Yesterday, I met with a family who flew here from Kentucky because they have a son who's 14 who has um, autism who is absolutely f like f focused, focused on baby Einstein. And they literally came here from Kentucky. Or, yeah, from Kentucky. And next week, I've got another 16-year-old for his 16th birthday. He wants to come to Colorado and meet me. I'm like, I have nothing to say. I don't know. Like, I think he thinks he's going to meet the puppets and stuff. And um, But anyway, you know, it's interesting. So I think music is such a universal language that it applies to so many different circumstances and ideas. And after we um, sold Baby Einstein, we actually had another startup that I didn't mention tonight um, called Memory Lane. And the impetus for Memory Lane was this. I would get these emails from parents who wrote to say, my baby loves baby Beethoven watches it all the time. But what's really interesting is that my mom has um, dementia and loves to watch it too. And we were like, well, that's pretty interesting. So we started thinking, well, it's kind of crummy. Like, you don't want to buy a baby video for your mom that's sad, right? But we thought, what could we do? What is it about the Baby Einstein videos that somebody with memory loss would like? And to me, it occurred to me that it was beautiful music and there's not a story to follow. It's just images, it's beautiful images that you like to look at, and we had, ba that babies like to look at. So what Memory Lane was, was a video that um, combined images that were important parts of people's life. So we would have videos, like we had a video called Family, and in that Family video, 
we would have snippets of like, uh, we'd have the song Love and Marriage by Frank Sinatra, and then we'd have a bunch of scenes of people getting married. And then we'd have a bunch of scenes of graduations. You know, we'd play pomp and circumstance. And it wasn't their family's graduation, but to be frank and not cruel, they didn't know their family anymore, but there was something in that music that affected them and made them happy. You know, like there's something in their heart and somewhere in their head, and you can do this with somebody who has a significant amount of memory loss, say it's Alzheimer's, they can remember songs. And so there was like a feel, a long-term memory. And so there's this feeling of music connecting us in different ways. So I feel really good about that. And, I, and I've heard from a number of people who um, used the videos and the music in the videos when they had children who were in the hospital. So like babies who have a hernia. And the mom says, you know, it was so hard because he had to be still for, you know, two weeks. And the only thing that we could do to keep him still was play Baby Einstein videos. That was really cool. That's great. What are the questions? Any others? Well, let's give, oh, we got one in the back. So the question is, sometimes it's very hard to stay engaged and focus and keep going. What did you do to help you in that process? It's been the hardest with this latest startup with WeSchool um, for me to stay engaged and focused. And I think it's because I can't do a lot of the work myself. I've had to hire people. And um, so I'm not as literally engaged, you know, sort of figuratively engaged. So it's been hard. I think that what... I do is I travel, obviously. I mean, I've, I've talked a lot about travel, and I am a huge world traveler. Um, I really believe in taking that time to yourself if you can. I'm a big believer in meditation, so I meditate daily, usually twice a day. Um, I think that all of that stuff is critical, not only for us to stay engaged with work, but to stay healthy in our bodies, right? So, um, yeah, I don't have a better answer for you. I'm sorry. I wish I did. I wish I could tell you I, like, exercised every day, but I don't. <laughs> Love it. Let's give you – oh, we have one more. Yeah. So what type of meditation technique do you like to practice? So I have a mantra. I went to a Deepak Chopra event um, many years ago, and I was given a mantra. And so um, I do the – oh, gosh, help me. What's the name of that type of meditation? Do you know? I feel like you must know because you're from India. Everyone from India must know. It's not transcendental. Say that again. Transcendental? Is that just when you just breathe? Yes. And just think about the breath. Okay. Transcendental. <laughs> I learned something. Yeah. Let's give Julie a round of applause. Okay, so now it's time for my 10 golden nuggets uh, that I take from what the speaker said. Again, if you have different nuggets, make your own nuggets. These are my nuggets. Um, I have to give a disclaimer, though. Hands down, after four years of having the Opportunity Coalition and over 60 speakers, Julie was probably one of the, if not my favorite speaker. And I'm sorry for the other speakers, but you rocked it. So let's give her a round of applause. You and I are cut from the same piece of cloth, being entrepreneurs, words matter, being positive. I just loved your, your talk. So hopefully everybody else did too. But anyway, so here are mine. Number one, what was your biggest, oh, sorry, that was my, my question. Number one, I like to always start off with the word remarkable. I love the word remarkable. Number two, start thinking about how you want to be remembered. You know, each of us has a short life. My stepfather w went away healthy in the morning and basically died that evening uh, in front of me. And no none of us know. You might be in the fourth quarter with a few seconds left on the clock. You might be in the second quarter. But live your life and figure out how you truly want to be remembered. Number three, every baby that is born is a bundle of opportunity. I love that. Is that not awesome? <laughs> love that. Everything we put into them matters. 
You know, and then it makes you think of the garbage in, garbage out, and all the other kind of sayings that go along with that. Number four, my idea was worth nothing unless I did something with it. You are what you do, not what you say you will do. Do it. Believe in yourself. That's awesome. Love that one. Number five, make your own luck. I found that the harder I work, the luckier I get. Number six, I want to encourage each of you to call your CNN, as you may never know how their story may play into yours. You know, we all think, oh, I can't call on that account. I can't make that phone call or whatever it might be. Make the call and do it today because it might be your CNN. Number seven, do stuff that you love as others may love it as well and you can make a living from it. Number eight, the days drag on but the years fly past. Should you or do you really want to go on a massive growth trajectory or should you rather focus on your family? You know, all of us as entrepreneurs, we think of that big moment, right, and growing the company to this huge scale. Should you? Is that what you should do? Why are you pointing at me? I'm just a small business owner. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't very nice, Pranima. Number nine, <laughs> get your books in order so you are ready to sell your business someday. Now, she was talking about actually selling her business and moving on, but you may need to get your books in order so you can even promote your business or get that next account. All of us need to get our books in order, whether personal, professional, whatever it might be. Number 10, think about a need and how you can personally fill it. I love that. And I'm going to give you the 11th one. I usually don't do this. I limited it to 10, but again, I, I gave my disclaimer at the beginning. Number 11, choose hope. It's, it always makes sense to pick the positive if you have a choice. And I personally believe we always have a choice. You, and I took a little title from your book and I kind of changed it, so I hope you don't mind. You can be the best medicine to someone in your life today. And I encourage each of you, there is someone in your life right now that you can make a phone call to, that you can give a word of encouragement to, that would mean the world to them and you don't know the impact that that will have. So I just want to thank you all for being here, and uh, we hope to see you uh, next time. Oh, what? We do. Well, Ed, I would just encourage you to bring a bunch of beer, and that'll make your talk so much better. I'm just telling you. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. We also have Joe Ossel, the founder of uh, Golf Tech. He's taken it uh, from nothing to over 230 locations and planning to grow on to 800, and he's going to be a speaker next year as well. So anyway, thank you all for being here. Invite your friends next time. <laughs>